Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to another Sacred Mountain Battle Report. Today I'm going to be going over Longstreet by Sam Mustafa and Honor Games. I like Sam Mustafa's games because generally they're well thought out, uh, they're somewhat historically accurate, and they're easy to play. Uh, Longstreet is only available in soft cover. I think it's about 20 bucks or so. Uh, to play the game, you need a copy, one copy of Longstreet. You'll need a deck of cards for each player, so two decks of cards if you're uh, planning on hosting the game, and uh, a set of tabletop miniatures of any scale, and of course, tabletop terrain. In addition to what most of you have uh, of cavalry, infantry, and artillery, you will probably also need limmer bases, but of course you can just substitute whatever you'd like for that. As you can see, there are four different types of cards uh, in the card deck. There are action cards, terrain cards, campaign cards, and biography cards. For today's game and for today's demonstration, we will not be using the campaign nor the biography cards as that's an advanced game uh, rule set and we'll only be using the action cards as well as the terrain cards. The way that the game is measured is in base widths, so hopefully it's base agnostic. And most of you will probably have both sides in order to play a game of American Civil War. For me, my infantry are on one and a half inch bases, while my cavalry and artillery are on two inch bases. For the purposes of my games, I'm going to be using two inches equals one base width. To give you an idea about ranges, uh, small arms fire are six base widths, and I believe a uh, Napoleon uh, uh, or a six pounder is like 18 base widths, and a Napoleon is about 24 base widths. So this would be a 48 inch range on a Napoleon. Next, we'll sort through the cards. As I mentioned, for the advanced game, is when you use the biography cards and the campaign cards. We will not be using those today. We'll only be using the action cards and the terrain cards. Next, I'll go through what the action cards do and how they, are, how they work. These are the action cards that come with the basic deck. There are three types of cards. There are generic cards that both the CSA and USA can use. There are national cards, the US cards and the Confederate cards. You'll note that some of the cards, uh, especially the national cards, and also with the campaign cards that we're not using, will have dates noted in their bottom right corner, and that indicates whether or not that particular card can be used in your game that you're playing that day based on which rule, I'm sorry, which year uh, is being uh, reenacted. So, for instance, if you were doing an 1865 game, the Confederates would not be able to use this particular card called Cavaliers. And uh, the same would be true for an 1861 game would not be able to use Yankee guns. So Longstreet is played only with six-sided dice. Uh, these can be uh, modified plus and minus one by various effects in the game. Sometimes rules will say that you may re-roll a dice, then you have an option to re-roll the dice. Say so you may re-roll that one, but you have to keep the second result. Uh, other rules will say that you must re-roll the dice. Uh, in that circumstance, you have to re-roll the dice uh, and must divide by the specific second result. Um, sometimes there's a tiebreaker uh, that's required and the person who's rolling the dice, uh, or it doesn't matter which, but the person who's rolling the die uh, will roll a single die for a tiebreaker. If the result is even, the person who rolled the dice wins. If the result is odd, the person who didn't roll the dice won. So the opposing player won that tiebreaker roll. To denote whether or not a uh, unit has fired, uh, you will end up using a puff of cotton for uh, that representation. So uh, Longstreet is for fairly small battles. Uh, each of your bases will represent 60 to 80 men, and an infantry uh, unit 
will uh, be represented by either two to ten bases, so pretty big units, uh, same with cavalry. Uh, an unlimbered artillery gun represents a section of two cannons, so, and two guns is a battery of a total of four guns. There are only three types of units. There's artillery, mounted units, and dismounted units. Dismounted units can include infantry as well as dismounted cavalry. So each unit will have a quality, uh, uh, both elan and experience. And it's suggested that to keep it historically accurate is that you label your units. Uh, for instance, this is the Missouri State Guard, uh, general by General Sterling Price, and I've labeled them as eager recruits. Uh, you can have some grizzled veterans like from the second main that would have an elan of cautious veterans. And this will represent uh, different values uh, and modifiers uh, in the game that we'll get to. Next, the book will talk about a little bit of uh, what formations are legal and what are not. This is considered a, this front is considered a full rank. The second is also, the second line is also considered a full rank. It goes through a couple illegal formations uh, that are not allowed, and that would be when you have an uh, odd number of bases and you have them in two ranks. This type of formation would not be allowed as the bases aren't lining up appropriately. In addition, it gives another type of illegal formation, and that is when the second rank is not fully filled out and has an empty space at the second rank that would not be a full rank. You have to fill in the ranks before you're able to add another rank. There are two named formations. Of course, this is column. And this formation, of course, would be line. Note that the in column, the leader was at the head of the formation, whereas in line, the leader is in the center of the formation. Um, the author goes on to describe that uh, skirmishers are considered uh, are somewhat abstracted in this just because of uh, the size of uh, the battles. Uh, I should also mention that uh, a four by six table uh, is just basically for our game is basically going to be one mile by one and a half miles uh, in size. So these are somewhat abstracted unit sizes. Next is uh, how you would describe uh, the what's to the front and what's to the rear. This is the considered the front line of the unit and everything in front of that is to the front. This is the flank line and everything uh, behind the front line uh, and also into the rear is called to the flank and anything that is directly behind is called directly to the rear. Similarly, anything directly in front is called directly to the front. Here is an example of measuring distances. Uh, in this circumstance we have the uh, Confederates here measuring a shot to the uh, Union here. It's measured the closest tip to tip, and here we have eight inches, and for my purposes, two inches is one base width, so this is four base widths distance. He also says that you can measure at any point during the game, whether it's your turn or not, unlike some tabletop war games. This is an example of a flanked attack, where the tip of the Union advance is touching the flank of the Confederate base messed up on the audio here uh, and the video recording. Uh, next you'll see a non-flanked unit that I'm setting up for. Here is an example of a Confederate uh, line that is not flanked by the Union charge. They are in base-to-base -base contact, but the tip of the Union advance is not touching the flank line. The actual 
base to base contact is at the front right corner of this Confederate unit. And so this, this, at this time, the Confederate unit is not flanked. Okay, the next example in the book of movement, or for movement, is uh, a bending column when you're moving around a piece of terrain in column. So when you're moving around a piece of terrain, your column may bend around it like it's on a road or marching around a house or around a forest. You're touching tip to tip. Your bases are touching tip to tip. And the bases that are not touching qualifying terrain, like these last two bases here uh, in the march column, have to directly align with the base in front of it as if it's marching along a road or something like that. The only other rule uh, for marching in column is one thing that is not allowed is here you have marching tip to tip. The front, the front uh, leader is facing this way. The second is facing this way, not quite 90 degrees. What you cannot do is have it at directly 90 degrees or more acute, and you can't have it like that as well, where the leader is facing this way, the second is facing this way, nor could you do a 90 degree turn like this, apparently, either. So here's an example of the ubiquitous waddle fencing uh, in the uh, United States at the time. And here we have a line that is bending. This is different than a column that is bending. This is a line that is bending, like a firing line. And it can bend around a stream or wattle fencing or something like that. And uh, the book makes special note that this is one flank line. So anything coming in from this side is flanked. And this is a flank line. So anything coming in from this side is flanked. So flanked, flanked is based on your end, your two end uh, bases. Also, it notes that only dismounted units can form a bending line. Although cavalry can form a bending column, they cannot form a bending line. Here we see a unlimbered artillery base. And the same rules will apply flank, front, rear. Uh, and then when the artillery is limbered, the limbered formation would, of course, look something like this. Those are the only two formations that are allowed for artillery, limbered and unlimbered. Limber bases are never placed in the broken box or never discarded. And even if you have multiple guns, like a three-section battery, where there are Pretend like this is a, a third gun. You have three guns here that are unlimbered. Anytime that you limber, the whole unit will just have a limber and a single gun. And that's the limbered, limbered section. Now, another way you can do it if you don't have the little uh, limber models uh, is a snappy nappy. And you could probably just limber them with the two guns facing each other. Now, once as your models are removed, uh, for uh, purposes of uh, being degraded or wounds or lost due to morale. Uh, you'll have to remember if you've lost a gun and then you limber and then you unlimber, you can't place this gun back, of course, because it's gone. And recall that here, with these two guns, or two gun bases, each of these will represent an artillery section and each base represents two guns. So when uh, Unlike certain other war games, uh, you remove bases to reflect casualties. And they uh, are removed from the game and cannot return to, into the game. They're placed in what is called the broken box. And uh, after the game, if you're doing a campaign for the more advanced game, you can uh, perhaps those units uh, or bases that have been removed are actually walking wounded and can return to the fight or the unit can be completely degraded uh, and that unit or that base could be killed. When deciding on whether or not to remove uh, a base, here we'll see the Union has shot, and let's just say this is the maximum range of their guns. It's not, but this say, we'll say that is, has shot, and let's say it's inflicted a casualty on the Confederates. The Confederates may choose which base to remove. They don't have to remove the closest base. They may, if they do so desire, remove a base even if it is out of range. And this base would get placed into the broken box. 
Next, the book talks about terrain and what is difficult and what is impassable. There's a small table here that you can decide which is difficult or impassable due to uh, foot and mounted and as well as artillery and it goes through woods, swamp, stream, river, rocky ground, wall, and ford. And you'll notice that woods and walls are neither difficult nor impassable for foot or mounted units. Here's an example of difficult terrain. We have the Union in rocky ground or a swamp or something like that. It would be difficult, considered difficult terrain and the Confederates not. You can see that they're in base-to-base -base contact, so the Confederates likely have charged in or perhaps the Union has charged through the difficult terrain. Now they are in base-to-base -base contact, the Federal unit will suffer penalties for being in difficult terrain. However, since the Confederates are not in difficult terrain anywhere, they will suffer no penalty. Here we have some examples of linear cover as noted by the book. There are a few different types of linear cover and they include hill crests and walls as well as fences. In this example, hill crests and walls will give cover from either uh, or from fire of any kind if they are just beyond the hill crest that you see here. Whereas the Union over here along this wattle fence would receive only advantages in melee and no advantages for cover because it's just a fence. If this was, however, if this was like a stone wall, they would receive similar cover as the hill. Here's an example of obstructing terrain. Examples of obstructing terrain include woods, walls, standing crops, and hill crests. Here, the Confederates are firing into the Union troops. The maximum range of their small arms fire is six base widths, which is 12 inches out to here as for my convention. Right now, their Union would be within range but there is this obscuring forest in the middle. They can still fire through this, provided that the Union troops are within two base widths. So that would be four inches. So from the back edge of the forest to the closest portion of this unit has to be within four inches or two base widths. Similarly, with obscuring uh, features such as walls or standing crops, you can still only go for two base widths beyond. For hill crests, however, you may not fire beyond the crest of the hill. It is, uh, you cannot see it at all. And here it gives an example of hill crests. Okay, here we have the table set up. Uh, what I'm going to use for this battle, uh, each Players are going to have uh, eager recruits, just to make it simple. I don't know whether or not you need a commander yet or not, so this may just be for decoration only. Uh, Sam Mustafa really likes to have his tables laid out in a certain manner. Um, so to the right will, uh, of each player's edge, this will be the Confederate edge, that's the Union edge. There will be a, uh, a deck of cards and then a discard pile as well as cards that are, have been removed from the game. For our purposes, cards will be um, removed from the game if they're underneath the flags of the Confederates or the uh, Union. Now, <clears throat> at the beginning of the game, each player is dealt a hand of six cards. Those cards uh, are kept in his hand and are not shown to the opposing player. Uh, there, is, uh, there are three phases to the game that I'll go over in just a second, but for now I'm going to tell you about the units. So we have two units of infantry with six bases each, one unit of cavalry with six bases, and one battery of guns with two bases. Okay, this is the six cards drawn by the Confederates. You'll see in the upper left corner at the double, there's a blue band there on all the cards except for the bottom right corner that says Old Rivals. Blue banded cards are just normal cards and red banded cards are interrupt cards that we'll talk about a little later. 
you can also see symbols of the Confederate cards, with the first one being a melee symbol, the uh, bugle being a movement symbol, and the rifle being a rifle symbol. Now cards are used to initiate a phase. I'll talk about phases in just a second. You can use any card you'd like to initiate a phase, and then you may modify it as the active player. Once you have modified the phase, uh, or uh, whether it's movement or firing or what have you, the passive player, the opponent, can potentially play one of his red cards, interrupt cards, to modify or affect what you're going to do that phase. Here are the Yankee cards. Uh, the, you, you can see they drew one interrupt and they drew three movement, one melee, and one shooting modifier. Now again, you don't have to use any particular type of card to invoke a phase, but you do have to use the symbol for modifying that card. So you just use any card to invoke a phase and then a second card to modify it, at which point your opposing player has the opportunity to interrupt using one of their cards. Also note on those cards is a number in the upper left hand corner. Those are the morale value of the card. What you can do with that is play those cards as the passive player to mitigate damage done by your opponent. You can play those cards to remove, for example, all that's seen in these bottom three are one. You can remove one hit from ranged or melee attacks. It removes a hit, but not a damage. The game is played in basically four phases, uh, with starting with the option to reshuffle. You'll reshuffle your cards when your deck is empty. You don't have you don't have an option. You must reshuffle at that time. And when you reshuffle, the top six cards are removed from the game, completely removed from the game, and then you deal yourself six cards. You may never discard a card to draw up to a maximum hand. You keep the cards that you're dealt with, unless you uh, opt to reshuffle that I'll discuss later. Then you have the option to invoke a fire phase uh, and uh, the opposing player could potentially interrupt if you decide to modify it or if you don't decide to modify it. And then you have one command choice, movement, combat, or you can pass. Finally, the status phase will be used and you'll decide uh, whether or not to redraw uh, and check for victory. So in the first step of your turn, you decide whether or not you are going to reshuffle. Uh, if you have no cards remaining in your action deck uh, off to the right hand side, you have to reshuffle. When you reshuffle, you keep the cards that you still have in your hand, but you take all the discarded cards and the remaining action cards and reshuffle the deck. Then you discard completely from the game those top six cards. These don't go into your hand, they are discarded from the game. It's important because once your deck is empty, meaning you have no action cards in your deck remaining, you lose the game. Losing those six cards every time you reshuffle is referred to as the reshuffling penalty. And as you can see, you'll pay a steep price for keeping reshuffling your cards to get those good ones. Also, cards will be discarded if you use an interrupt to actually interrupt rather than invoking a phase. So if you interrupt your opponent with an interrupt card, it is also removed from the game. You may never voluntarily discard a card. Okay, here we're going to talk about firing in Longstreet. Uh, what we will use is a uh, base width ruler uh, to determine who can fire. Here it's the Confederate's turn and they're going to fire. You can do it in any order you want. Um, the only units eligible for firing is unlimbered artillery and dismounted cavalry or infantry. Mounted cavalry may not fire, ever. Um, they have to dismount to fire. They're only, they can only be used for melee. They won't shoot from horseback. In this example, we're going to go from uh, right to left, starting with the artillery. Uh, we're just going to call this a Napoleon. Uh, and this would normally hit because it's in canister range, which is six base widths or less. Here you have a base width going through. 
it's going to, uh, the Napoleon will hit on a four plus with a modifiers to hit versus a dense target, no, versus cover, no. So no modifiers, the Napoleon would need a four or higher to hit. And the, recall that this is two guns, so it rolls two dice. Here, the infantry is also going to fire. This base is not uh, obscured. This base is not obscured. However, this base is slightly obscured by the cavalry here. And so this base may not fire. It gets two shots. And cap or small arms fire, if it's a uh, recruit level, it hits on a five up. It does not have dense cover, and the shooter is not in difficult terrain. Now here we see the roll. The gun, the Napoleon, at short range shooting canister, rolled a five and a one. The five scores a hit. The one always misses. Here the two uh, infantry stands, one rolls a six, the other rolls a four, and recall these are recruits, so they need a five or higher. But sixes will always hit regardless, so two hits are scored on the Union line. Now the hits have been allocated. So there, this unit has taken two hits, one from the infantry, one from the guns. Now looking at the Union hand of cards, uh, they have a hand of six cards, recall. In that upper left corner, there's a number. Now the Union can opt to lay one of these cards down to mitigate one of those hits. Now, they may not want to lay down this one uh, because it's an interrupt card, but they are going to lay down one. Now, if they did lay down a two, they can't remove both hits. One hit must stay, so it would be wasted anyway. So they're going to lay down a retrograde card. Using that one, they're going to be able to remove one of the hits. And subsequently, that card will be placed in the discard pile. Now, once that card is placed in the discard pile and all the modifiers have been done and all the cards have been laid, you then roll to kill. So, any dice or tokens that are next to a unit after the firing will be picked up by the uh, firing player and will be rolled. To kill, a, to kill a base, a four or higher needs to be rolled. So let's say I rolled a five. In that case, the, the union player, the target player, would be choose one of the bases, whichever base he wanted, to remove and go into the broken box. Here is an example of artillery firing and artillery target priority. Here we have Confederate guns one and two and Union units, infantry units, A and B, and then a cavalry unit, C. This is the canister range, short range for the artillery gun. Here we have gun number, Confederate gun number one must shoot at this uh, infantry unit A because it is the first contacted in its firing zone which extends one base width and six bases out. Similarly, uh, the second Confederate gun cannot shoot at this, at this uh, Union because the first unit contacted is Unit B, the Union Unit B. If this unit was not there, then both guns would be able to shoot at this unit or could shoot at this unit. If neither unit was there, then they could bombard, because they are out of canister range, they could bombard any unit, includes unit C, but they would be able to bombard at 45 degrees off, not just in this single firing line. I should also note that, let's say this unit is not there, this unit, as second priority, would not get to bombard, but must shoot at this unit. Okay, here's an example of 
three Confederate guns firing at a group of Union soldiers in cover. This is a three base battery, base one, two, and three. Base one's fire zone is completely obstructed by the wall. You can see moving directly forward, this wall, it interferes, the wall interferes with the entire front of the firing zone. Uh, so this, the, the target will receive benefits of cover from the wall. Base two uh, is only partially obstructed by the wall. That means that its fire would penetrate only another two base widths beyond. So if the, if the unit was a little further back, for instance, if the unit uh, was only, well, if, if the wall was closer, like this, I should say, if the wall was closer like that and still only partially in this cannon's way, and if it was here, that's two base widths beyond, although it's still within canister range, it cannot penetrate beyond two base widths like we discussed earlier. But the wall is here for now. Base uh, three's fire zone reaches the, in, the target entirely in the open, and so no bonus would be allowed, no uh, cover bonus would be allowed for it. Now back to base two. Base two uh, would not get uh, any modification for cover. I should also note that artillery may not shoot from within woods. Uh, they cannot uh, uh, shoot from within water either. However, they can shoot from within difficult terrain. Here's an example of some difficult terrain, perhaps some rocky ground or swampy ground. Uh, these cannons are allowed to shoot from that terrain. Cannons are allowed to shoot on elevated positions over friendly units, but it has to be a bombardment shot. It cannot be canister. In this case, the cannon would be using canister fire, and so that would not be allowed even though it's on an elevated terrain uh, because of the intervening friendly unit. If this was bombardment range and there was a friendly unit, if the this would be allowed if the friendly unit was greater than six base widths, one of these greater than six base widths away from the cannon and greater than six base widths away from the target. So one of these again. Okay, this is where it gets a little weird. So uh, there are two types of shooting uh, in, uh, for small arms. There's volley fire and skirmishing. Volley fire, uh, if you can lay down a fire zone to your front, uh, up to short range or six base widths, which this is, that does not pass over any cover uh, or crest of a hill prior to hitting the enemy. So in this example, uh, the uh, A and B, where they're boom and boom, would be going through cover uh, before they can hit an enemy target, whereas C and D can hit enemy targets that aren't quite in cover. So these two can volley fire. These two must skirmish fire. The next, and to uh, skirmish, they have to shoot at this target and they, or they can shoot off to the side there. I'm sorry, I misspoke. You have to, Volley fire has to be directly to your front. You would skirmish if you had to move off to the uh, right. Uh, so these two will be skirmishing. They will hit on sixes uh, because they're both skirmish firing. These two would hit, if they are recruits, would hit on fives. If they're veterans, they would hit on fours. So skirmish fire uh, is kind of a shorthand for basically saying firing at a unit in cover. Interestingly, even if there is a hill between you and you can't technically see over the hill. Due to skirmish firing rules, even if you can't see the target at all because of the hill or if it's two base widths behind uh, a group of trees, that is considered this abstracted skirmish fire 
and they can shoot skirmish fire. Okay, just a quick note on modifiers. The modifiers are very, this is the entirety of the modifiers to hit page and to hit page. Um, I just want to do a quick note on what exactly a dense unit is. So this counts as a dense unit. Uh, if the Confederates were firing uh, at the Union unit and it's in march, col uh, march column, that is a dense unit and that gives you a bonus to hit. In addition, if you are enfilading a target, that also gives you that dense target bonus. And to enfilade a target, all you have to do is be behind its front rank. So here they are a dense target, so they're all the the union are facing this way. Here they're a dense target. And even here they're a dense target when they're being shot at from behind. Okay, here is a full example of a uh, shooting phase. Here it is the Federals or the Union turn and uh, they have uh, already gone through the reshuffle uh, part of their turn and they have decided to invoke a firing phase. They lay down a card. It can be any card, it does, even though this says at the double and it's a melee card, it doesn't necessarily have to invoke a melee phase. Then they decide they're going to uh, modify their shooting phase with exposed positions. The active player may reroll any dice that fail to uh, their rolls to kill in this phase. So that would be after uh, the hits have been made, then you roll to kill. Now the Confederate may decide to modify and he does. He plays obsolete muskets. And this federal inventories of obsolete smoothbores have not yet been so, uh, sorted out. Play immediately after the enemy has invoked a fire phase. All enemy units firing volleys have a minus one penalty to hit. So these will be all active during this phase. Here we have Union uh, Unit A and B firing at the Confederates. The two leftmost bases in uh, Unit A can't fire because there's no eligible target either in their firing zone or 45 degrees out of their firing zone. The leftmost base of B can't fire because no matter how it adjusts its firing zone, a bit of Federal A is in the way. So you have Here's its firing zone, boom. It's gonna, this base is in the way of its target. So this, this unit can't, or that base cannot fire either. So federal, the Federals, the Union, will roll five dice. Two from unit A, this one and this one, and three from unit B, this one, this one, and this one. So in the example, B are veterans, and they normally need a four to hit, but the Confederate played obsolete muskets, and that made it a five up to hit. So after the roll, B has rolled a five, four, and a one. The one doesn't hit, the four would hit, but the Confederates played obsolete muskets that gave it a minus one to hit, so now, even though they're veterans, they're hitting on fives. So they only scored one hit. This unit, because they are uh, shooting through uh, cover and have obsolete muskets, only rolled a six, which auto hits. Those hits are then assigned to that unit. And then We'll move on to other parts of the table and then come back after all the shooting has been resolved and roll these two dice to kill, needing a four or higher for exposed positions. Now at this point before, so these two were uh, assigned, the Confederate player could choose a card with a value of one or more, doesn't matter, 
but could take away one of those hits if he so desired. But he's not going to. So now with that exposed, well, so now these guys need a four up to kill bases. And a one and a two were rolled. But due to exposed position that the federal player played, he gets to re-roll these. So one, one base dies and that gets placed in the broken box. Hooray, so now we're on to movement. Um, so uh, there's a very easy table in the book that talks about movement. Mounted units uh, move eight base widths. Foot units move four base widths. Artillery moves six base widths if they are limbered. In column, uh, the uh, foot unit would move six base widths. The mounted move, uh, unit would move ten base widths. And of course, no column is allowed for artillery. Uh, and then for flank moves, and I'll go over flank moves, they can move half their total movement allowance. I should also mention that a unit in column may never end its movement phase within six base widths of an enemy. Now, a word on disorder. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you invoke a movement phase after you have attempted to invoke a fire phase uh, by laying a card down. Here we'll say the Union have invoked uh, a movement phase with this card. Uh, this card is not a modifying card. So they've invoked a movement phase. Now they can, uh, uh, with that, now they can make movement. They can potentially modify that with, for instance, retrograde. All units may flank march without having their movement allowances if they decided to do that. In this case, they didn't. However, uh, the way that uh, Longstreet handles disorder is if you are going to be having any disordered unit movements, you have to invoke the movement phase with two action cards rather than just one. There are just a, there's a short list of things that cause disorder, and that's a friendly unit interpenetrates another friendly unit, uh, a unit that moves through uh, or into difficult terrain, either by making a uh, formation change uh, or just moving through it, a unit uh, that makes an about face within six base widths of the enemy, and a unit that changes formation within six base widths of an enemy. Here is a union unit in line. It may either move as it's in line or it may change formation but not both unless a card allows it. We talked earlier about bent lines where you would be up against a wattle fence for example. This unit cannot move. It must first change formation to a straight line before it can move, unless a card allows it to do otherwise, and I believe that card's called move out. A unit in march formation, however, would be able to make moves and bend around terrain without having a formation change, for example, here. Now there are different types of movement. Uh, a unit can wheel by pivoting around a uh, point on their, on their base. For instance, pivoting around here and wheeling three base widths like that and using up some of its uh, uh, movement allowance. And then it can also perform an oblique where uh, it can move at up to 45 degrees of an angle additionally. And so let's say it's going to move another two base widths and it could move at 45 degrees and it could move to about here. And so that's a combination of a wheel and an oblique using up about, I think that was six 
uh, base widths of movement. Anything greater than 45 degrees, for instance, let's say instead of moving in an oblique fashion this way, it wants to go more oblique in that direction. This is what is called a flank march, and that it can only do with half the number of movement points it has. Additionally, a flank march would be a retrograde where it's walking backwards or walking backwards in any direction, whether it's 45 degrees, a full straight back, or obliquely. Finally is the about face. Any move or any unit in line, whether it's infantry, dismounted cavalry, or cavalry itself in a line may perform an about face where each base is turned in its place facing the other way and then is able to make its movement. So if you did that within six base widths of an enemy that would cause disorder. You would have to pay two cards to do that. Uh, in addition, uh, you can move uh, just your normal movement and you can uh, subsequently after you about face you can wheel like we talked about or we you can do an oblique movement as well here's an example of changing formation there you can do a left or right face formation change here we're going to do a left face so you would take your leftmost facing leftmost facing bases and simply turn them in place and this would count as your formation change similar for right face here's another example of changing formations and you do it by choosing a guide on spelled g-u-i-d-o-n and you choose but you can only shift by two base widths so here I'm going to choose this base as the guide on just the one just to the left of the standard bearer and then I'm going to shift the entire unit to the right of the guide on and this is an example of changing formation by guide on in addition you could potentially change the formation by guide on to potentially redeploy the entire unit within a wall for example, Here's, this is a good example of why you might want to do that, is you choose this unit as your guide on, and then you're able to get that entire unit, except for part of this base, behind a wall. And we've discussed this kind of in the converse situation. You can change deployment by, uh, or change formation by deploying, for instance, deploying along a bent line, and that would count as a change of formation as well. Here's another example of changing formations by guide on that ends up in difficult terrain. I'm going to choose this unit as a guide on, and I'm going to shift two base widths over and end the unit like this, ending in difficult terrain, which would cost again two action cards because of causing disorder. Now, any number of disorder, any a number of units that are in disorder will just still co cost you two action cards total for the phase, not two per. It's two total for the phase. Another example of formation change would be dismounting a cavalry. So let's say the cavalry has previously moved up to this wall and they want to change formation and they are going to dismount and they are now considered dismounted cavalry and may fire like infantry from cover. Of course that's a formation change occurring within six base widths of the enemy so they would have to use two action cards because of the disorder. And last but not least we have the artillery. So here we have limbered artillery. It could move 
uh, six base widths uh, in the manner that we've noted earlier. Uh, an unlimbered artillery uh, could potentially prolong where uh, that's moved by hand rather than limbering. It can move one base width. Um, and of course, changing formation within six base widths would cause disorder. All right, we're moving on to the charge phase. Uh, so to uh, perform a charge, you first have to, of course, activate the charge phase with an action card, and then you could potentially modify that action card with a uh, charge action card. Uh, I don't have any right here, but it would be a face up modifier with a uh, cross sabers uh, icon. Then of course, the opposing player would potentially have the ability to modify that with an action card of their own. One of the first things you have to do is check the eligibility of someone uh, being able to charge. Here we have examples of people who cannot charge. An infantry unit cannot charge a cavalry unit. An artillery unit cannot charge either infantry or cavalry. The artillery unit may not charge at all. A nonlinear unit may not charge. So a broken line formation may not charge. A cavalry unit may not charge anyone if it has to go through woods or if at the end of the charge phase or at the end of the movement, the cavalry unit's base would be within woods. Okay, here we have the Confederates starting a charge move. Now, the rules state that you have to charge the closest legal target. So this is a legal target and this is a legal target, but this unit is closer. You generally have to charge straight forward. However, this is, you are also allowed to wheel uh, as a part of the uh, wheel or oblique as a part of the um, charge move. So in this case, the Confederates could potentially wheel two to turn around this unit and then continue the charge and make the charge movement. Here's the point of first contact, which will determine who fights. The caveat to this is that uh, also a illegal charge would be if there was intervening difficult terrain. So this would now make this an illegal target of the charge and would have to charge through this or charge to this unit. Uh, if you are, uh, if there is a complication, you have to invoke the charge phase with two cards. Here we have a Confederate unit that has charged the Union Unit B and is also engaged with the Union Unit A. The Confederate unit stopped at the moment of contact, but because the Confederates are still within one base width of this other unit, they are considered engaged with this unit as well. Here's a similar example. The Confederates have charged into the Union Unit A and B is facing the other way. B is facing this way. Although the Confederate unit is engaged with this unit and it would be engaged if it was flanked and in base to base, neither unit is flanked because he is only engaged with the uh, Union unit. However, if this unit was turned around this unit would be flank charged, but this unit would still only be engaged. Another quirk of close combat, here we have the Confederate units engaging this unit A of the Union in close combat. Although this Union B is within one base width, this unit is not engaged because at least one base of the Confederates must be able to draw a line from each corner of its base to, to 
uh, within one base width to uh, be engaged with the Union unit. Um, so here from this corner would pass through this unit A before it contacted the Union unit B. Therefore, this unit is not engaged. However, if it was like this, this unit, both units would be engaged because a line could be drawn without obstruction within one base width to this unit. Here, both units are engaged. Here, they are not. Here we're allocating dice. We have this very large Confederate unit consisting of 11 bases charging this Union unit consisting of three bases. The first thing you do is announce dice allocations. So if there were multiple, you would allocate more dice to other engaged units potentially. Only the first two ranks may allocate dice. These guys don't get any dice because they're three or four ranks deep. In addition, the most dice that any one unit can allocate is 10. Although, if you have multiple units charging, you may allocate more than 10, but uh, to a defender, uh, but uh, the most that any one unit has in their pool to allocate is 10. And this is regardless of modifiers. Later, uh, apparently some dice, you can have dice added due to campaign rules or uh, potentially action cards or personality cards but only 10 dice can be allocated. Here, the front two ranks consist of six, two, four, five, six dice. And so the Confederates will allocate all six dice to this Union unit. Here is an example from the book. You have a, a six base Confederate unit that charged and simultaneously contacted Federal units A and B. It is also within one base width of Federal Unit C and is thus engaged all three units. You can see a line can be drawn without intervening from this base. Um, now, uh, he can allocate, the Confederate player can allocate dice uh, based on certain limitations. Federal Unit A occupies only one file of his front but is in enemy contact, so he can't give uh, it just so he can't give it just one die if he's eligible to allocate more. Uh, Federal B, the other enemy uh, that the Confederate unit physically contacts, occupies three files of his front, uh, one, two, three. Um, the Confederate player can't allocate fewer dice to B than it does anyone else because it occupies the most of his frontage. Federal Unit C is engaged but not in contact and occupies less than half the attacker's front, thus only marginally engaged. The Confederate player opts to allocate only a single dice to it, three dice to Unit B, and two dice to Unit A. After the dice are allocated, you can calculate the defense score. Uh, you'll roll uh, to defend, so uh, the passive player will now roll a dice for each defending unit in any order he chooses, and that's called rolling to defend. For recruits, it's a four or higher. For veterans, it's a three or higher. Sometimes a unit is considered vulnerable. A vulnerable uh, unit would be uh, defending artillery or potentially uh, if it is flanked. Limbered artillery have a little bit of uh, special ability to escape uh, if needed and we'll go over to that in a second. First we're going to do the defenders dice and calculate the defense score. So when you're rolling to defend you base your defense roll on the target as the passive player, you're the target, the union is the target, you base that defense roll on their experience. So it's either, they're either veterans, recruits, and they have a special modifier uh, if they are vulnerable. Vulnerable, uh, like we discussed with artillery or somebody that's flanked, would be considered vulnerable, and they only hit on sixes. 
Recruits, like I said earlier, will hit on fours. Veterans will hit on threes. There's also a difficult terrain modifier of minus one to that score. Then you calculate the attack scores. We've already distributed the dice, and that's based on the, tar or the active player's elan, or how spirited they are. Are they eager or are they cautious? What have you. And uh, there are three levels, eager, seasoned, and cautious. Eager hits on a three or higher. Seasoned hits on a four or higher. Cautious hits on a five or higher. There are some modifiers uh, with cover if there was intervening wall, if they're attacking in difficult terrain, and they get a plus one if the defender is, in, is uh, vulnerable. Uh, cavalry only modifiers include uh, mounted versus the front of an enemy foot is a minus one, uh, and uh, cavalry, uh, uh, dismounted cavalry attacking is also a minus one. So here we have all these guys are going to be recruits. Everyone is going to be eager, eager recruits right here. Now I have rolled the dice, and these, the attacking unit is eager, so they have a success on a three or higher. Here you see a four, five, one, four. So the five, one, four will be allocated to this unit. The four will be allocated to this unit. And uh, a five and a five allocated to this unit. So we have two hits versus this unit, two hits versus this unit, and one hit versus this unit. The defenders, because they are recruits, uh, defend on a four or higher. Here we have two successful defenses here, one, or three successful defenses here, and two, or I'm sorry, one successful defense here. None of these units are vulnerable, and so there won't be any combat modifiers to this. So now we're calculating the defense scores, or the attack scores and the defense scores, and they get compared. Here we have two successes, and two successes for defense. So the net score is zero here. Here we have two successes versus three successes, so the net score in the defender's favor is one. Here we have one success versus one success, so the net score here is zero. So for the, we have a zero here, uh, one in the defender's favor here, and a zero here. So this is a net loss for this Confederate unit, and they would be forced to remove a base, any base, and then fall back. Obviously a poor choice for this Confederate unit. We'll be discussing fallback moves in just a moment after I do one more multi-combat scenario from the book. Here is an example of multi-unit combat resolution. The Confederate player has charged two units into contact, Confederate Unit 1 and Confederate Unit 2. Confederate Unit 1 has charged Union Unit A, and Confederate Unit 2 has charged Federal Unit B. Note that Confederate Unit 2 also barely engages Federal Unit A. All units are seasoned veterans. First, the Confederate player allocates his dice. Confederate unit one is easy. All four dice get allocated to union unit A. Confederate unit two is a bit trickier. It allocates, or it has three ranks. So only the, so the two bases in the back rank don't get to allocate at all. Confederate Unit 2 gets only six dice. He is only marginally engaged against Federal A, that is, not in contact, and occupies less than half of his front, so he could opt to devote only one of his dice to Federal A. But he decides instead to split his dice evenly and thus allocates three dice to Federal A and three dice to Federal B. Had the Confederate player charge Federal B just a little bit more to the right, he could have been able to concentrate all of his strength versus Federal B. 
As it turns out, a total of seven Confederate dice, three plus four, will be rolled against Union A, and only three dice versus Union B. Here is after the dice is rolled. Recall that these are all seasoned veterans. The federal player calculates his defense scores. For Unit A, he rolls six dice, and he needs, because they're a veteran unit, they need three or higher. He scores, his scores succeed on a three up, and he rolls and only gets one three. The rest are fails at two or below. Unit B also rolls, or rolls four dice, and fortunately for him, he rolls all three or higher. Then the Confederate player now rolls his dice. He is a seasoned veteran as well, but because he is seasoned and not eager, he has to hit on a four or higher. Recall that there were seven dice allocated to Federal Unit A. This unit got two hits of on, on a four or higher, and this unit out of three got two hits out of a four or higher, bringing the total attack score on Federal Unit A to four, and a defense score of one. On Federal Unit B, the defense score is four, and the Confederate unit was only able to get two out of three, and so the attack score is two. So, Federal A has lost combat by a difference of three. Four minus one is three. Therefore, the U.S. player will have to remove three bases of his choosing and then fall back. And this is a little bit different over here. Federal B has won with a difference of two. Therefore, the Confederate unit number two must lose a single base and fall back. So let's go back and explain this in a little bit more detail with regards to the combat resolution chart found on page 66. First, the attacker announces dice allocations. Recall this unit allocated four, uh, three dice, or I'm sorry, four dice uh, to this unit, and this unit allocated three dice to this unit, and then allocated the other three dice to this unit. Step two is you calculate the defense scores. Um, you roll for all six bases here, and roll for all four bases here. We had one success here, and four successes here. That is the defense score. Then we calculate the attack scores after rolling. The, uh, uh, this attack score had four successes total, so the attack score was four. Here, only two successes total, so the attack score was two. Then we resolve combat. First, the passive player may use cards to potentially mitigate some of the losses. For instance, here, the passive player, the union, could potentially use this card to mitigate a base loss. Now, he could use multiple cards to mitigate all, potentially remove up to three of those losses, but one hit sticks, so he still has to lose one base and still has to fall back. So defenders who lost combat take their losses and fall back. Uh, this unit, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this, uh, it was this unit that, so this unit would have been able to uh, mitigate, uh, but this unit won, so he doesn't have to mitigate. The, the um, uh, uh, I don't believe the Confederates would have the option to mitigate losses here. Uh, only the passive player can mitigate losses. So now the defenders who lost combats take the losses and fall back. Here we have a loss of one, and they would have to fall back. Now, we are, so these guys fall back. And we'll, like I said, we'll discuss that fallback move in just a moment. Now these guys are still in combat with the defender having won that. Attackers still engaged, which they are, 
will take losses and fall back. Okay, I want to just clarify something, and I'm going to read directly from the book. After we've calculated the defender's losses and the defenders have fallen back, they've lost their three bases here and have fallen back, then we resolve the attacker's losses. After all defending units have lost combats, have fallen back, the only defending units left engaged with attacking units should be those whose defensive scores are equal to or greater than the attacking scores against them. Those defenders who have won their combats, a tie is a win for the defender, attackers still engage with them, have therefore lost combat. Each attacking unit that is still engaged with a defender, whether or not he is still in base-to-base -base contact with any of the defenders, at this step must lose only one base. After the attacking our active player has removed all those bases required to on all the attacking units that have lost combats, they must now then fall back. The active player may fall back in any order that he desires. Okay, here we are at that same scenario. I've put the, all the bases back, and uh, this is how a unit falls back. First, the bases that need to be removed are removed prior to the fallback move. This is for the defender. The defender then rolls two dice. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, or the unit must fall back rolls two dice. The active unit, which is the Confederates, uh, picks the lower of the two dice, and the passive unit would pick the higher of the two dice, and this signifies the minimum distance which the unit must fall back, provided that it meets two criteria, at least the least distance from, uh, from the enemy unit at which it, with which it was engaged, and it may not be within one base width of an enemy unit. So let's say these guys are rolling. They have to pick the higher of the two, so they have to fall back six base widths. So that is a big fallback move all the way back to uh, the farmhouse here that may be out of frame. Uh, now, they have, if they can't in their, uh, in their uh, fallback move over a friendly unit, and they have to continue to fall back until they cannot, if they have to fall back through difficult terrain, they have to lose another base each time that happens. And six base widths is the minimum, so it can't be less than six base widths. So they would have to continue falling back until they were not in difficult terrain. Alternatively, you can choose to discard a card from your hand and avoid losing that base. Either player may do so. So here, the Confederate or active player, now, so these guys have to fall back and they will end in the same formation uh, and they have to fall back over six because of this forest that is maybe just off your, uh, off the viewing screen. Uh, and now the Confederates would roll and they would roll, ooh, double sixes. Let's say they rolled a four and a six. They would only have to fall back four base widths and end in the same formation. Similarly, if they fell back through uh, terrain, uh, they would have to end that on the outside of difficult terrain, and uh, they would lose a base again or have to discard a card. Okay, here's another example from the book. This is a multiple combat where Confederate Unit 1 has charged a uh, artillery battery, a Union artillery battery, and is also in base-to-base -base contact and is also engaged this unit in a broken line at a wall. Here we have the defense and attack scores, the attack scores in red, the defense scores, whoops, the attack scores in red, and the defense scores in uh, uh, green. Uh, Confederate Unit 1 has charged and contact the Federal Unit art, art, Artillery Battery and also engaged this Federal Infantry. Uh, Confederate Unit 2, over here, was not involved in the combats. The artillery lost by a difference of 2. Well, that should be a 4, I think, actually. Um, they lost by a difference of 2 here, and let's put this at a 4. Lost by a difference of 2. Uh, and the federal player used a card here to mitigate one of those losses, but he still must lose one base here. 
Uh, having lost, he rolls two dice and is forced to fall back. And recall that he will have to take the higher of the two. So he has to fall back two base widths. Here, uh, the Federal Infantry lost by a difference of one uh, and also must fall back. It loses one base and then rolls. It rolls a four and a three. Taking the higher result means that it, fail, it must fall back by four base widths. Uh, note that it was nonlinear formation conformed to the angle of the wall when it falls back, so it must change its formation to a linear one, uh, which it does. Uh, if there was any question about its path, for instance, uh, the area uh, was more crowded with units or terrain, then the unit's footprint would have to be assumed to be three base widths wide, as that is the formation in which it ended. So to fall back with this unit, it must then limber and then fall back its, taking the highest, ooh, six base widths. So it must fall back further. And remember, when you limber, you just use one cannon and one limber, and that will count for two cannons, and you just have to remember that. So it's fallen back. And now this unit fell back three base widths, three, so about to here, and it will end in a linear formation after having lost its single base. Here is one of our final examples of combat, and it's with limbered artillery. Here you see a group of unlimbered artillery with a closing in group of Confederate soldiers that are going to attempt a charge. Now, the Union player decides in, uh, on his previous turn when he's the active player, He's going to decide these guys are just a little too close or the rest of the army is a little too close and he's going to go ahead and limber this artillery. So recall he has three sections here. He will just limber by removing two of the sections and limber up. He can do it in any way you want, but here's what we're just going to say it's like this. So now this now it's the Confederate's turn, and let's say he successfully completes a charge and is now in base-to-base -base contact with the limbered artillery. He rolls for his four, his four dice, and let's say he gets a total of three successes. Now, different, different than any other combat, the limbered artillery that has three sections in it, it rolls two dice and takes the highest if it was a foot unit that charged and the lowest if it was a mounted unit that charged. So now they roll and they roll a four and a five. Let's say they rolled a one and a three. Thus tying this, they would be eligible now to fall back without losses. This is now their defense score. If it was a cavalry unit that charged and they rolled a one with a similar defense score of three or attack score of three, this would have been broken and the whole unit would have been lost. In addition, let's say that uh, the, uh, these, the Confederates got a roll of three or an attack score of three, so they had three successes. And I'll replace this with just a three to indicate the attack score. They rolled two dice and they got a two. Well, the, that would mean, indicate that this whole unit of section of three guns, uh, or three, three sections, would be destroyed and broken, removed from the game. However, they can play a card to tie and thus win the combat and potentially, and then they would be able to break off and fall back without losing a gun. Hey, thanks for watching the video. Uh, even if you didn't watch the whole thing, which I wouldn't blame anyone not watching uh, over five minutes of that video, uh, the subsequent video is going to be uh, actual gameplay of Longstreet. And I'm on turn two and it's going fast. It is definitely going to be in the beer and pretzels category of tabletop war games. 
Uh, so far, it's the fastest gameplay of any horse and musket, black powder type tabletop war game that I've ever played. And it's got this kind of cool card mechanic. It's cheap, and it was written by a historian who is devoted to tabletop wargaming and maintains a website uh, through Honor Games. Highly recommended. I'm going to have a formal review following my uh, How to Play series, which will be two videos. And uh, the other video will actually probably be a little bit better on learning how to play and seeing how the actual mechanics work. But I had my batteries die, so I went ahead and recorded this conclusion to the video. Thanks again for watching. Happy Wargaming, and I'll see you out there.